Hello, this is Dave Tab, and today we're going to talk about how to visualize a proteoform spectrum match in ProSight Light or in Eclipse MS, uh, two different tools that have been created for this purpose. Uh, our demonstration today is going to use a raw file uh, with a very, very long name. You can see that it extends to the second line, found over here at Proteome Exchange 032724. Uh, you can, of course, do this with any file of your own um, interchangeably, but, uh, of course, which scan number you use and which sequence you apply to it will differ. Um, in any case, this is largely the exercise of what you do after you have, a, uh, in order to confirm an identification of a tandem mass spectrum and likely to publish it, uh, because in a lot of cases, the, uh, the type of figure that we use to illustrate that we have really identified a particular proteoform is its fragment map. And those fragment maps can be produced by either of these two tools. Okay, so for that, we're going to need three tools. We're going to start with ProSight Lite, uh, which is a very, very widely used tool uh, from the Proteomics Center of Excellence at Northwestern University. It is not a search algorithm. You might be familiar with ProSight PD or ProSight PC, uh, but ProSight Lite is instead a tool to visualize the match, to take a given sequence and overlay it on a tandem mass spectrum, a deconvolved tandem mass spectrum. Um, the other tool that we're going to look at is Clips MS. Uh, Clips MS does not have the same um, easy to use download page, but if you're familiar with GitHub, it should be relatively easy to find your way around. Essentially, to find the software you want to install, you come down here to releases, click on Clips MS 2.0.0, and then download the zip file and expand it on your hard drive. So those are uh, the two tools that we're going to use for aligning sequences, the tandem mass spectra. Um, and the other tool we're going to use is Notepad++. Now, normally I would just say, use whatever text editor you want, but today we really are going to use a feature uh, that is special to Notepad++ to help clean up our peak lists. So uh, today's uh, emphasis, emphasis would be that. Um, I've written out some directions for us. Uh, remember that you're going to need to grab this raw file uh, from Proteome Exchange, and you should already have Freestyle installed. I have uh, started Freestyle over here in a window. I, I want to mention that I typically have changed the default configuration for the deconvolution algorithm in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Freestyle by dropping extracts signal-to-noise threshold down to 1 from 3. So you, if, if you want to reproduce my result exactly, uh, change that signal-to-noise threshold down to um, uh, the noisier setting, as it were. Okay, um, now I have a tutorial directory here. Uh, you won't have the PowerPoint file. Hopefully, uh, you can reconstruct this step-by-step -step from the information I'm posting on YouTube, um, but you should have the raw file here. We, we start, then, by simply opening the raw file in Freestyle, and, of course, you can just drag it over. That's probably the simplest way to do it. It's not a huge raw file. Um, but it will take a, a little moment to open it. There it is. Uh, we can close that. Now, um, in my directions, I've specified a particular precursor, or, uh, sorry, a particular tandem mass spectrum that we want. We want scan 794, and we want the, which has a precursor mass to charge of 801.4. Uh, the easiest way to find that is to click around a little bit. Uh, here we see that we're at scan 553. That's still too low. We want to come up here. 833. What was the number we were looking for? 794. Okay, so I'm going to click a little closer to here, and I'm going to just use the left arrow to get us the rest of the way over to 794. That's 795. That's 794 right there. Okay, so this is a promising spectrum. Lots and lots of uh, interesting little peaks here. We next need to deconvolve the spectrum. Uh, so for this, I'm going to go to Workspace Processing and open the Extract Deconvolution pane. Um, when I look at the result here, I see that uh, this is saying extract all at the bottom. Now, if you saw my last video, you might think that's where we're heading. But today, we're not going to deconvolve the entire raw file. We're only going to deconvolve this particular tandem mass spectrum. So keep your eye on this pane as I click the spectrum. Ah, so now we've changed away from extract all to simply an apply button in order to do an assessment of this particular tandem mass spectrum. Now, I have a limited amount of screen real estate, so I'm going to turn the, uh, the chromatogram to auto-hide mode. It gives me a little more space to look at this. 
I also feel strongly that I want to uh, do this deconvolution in a way that best suits my visualization downstream. You can see that I have either neutral mass or protonated forms for storing the deconvolved peaks. In my directions, I specify it directly, again, in a difference from the presentation I did before, that we want to do MH plus ions. So we're going to click on MH plus rather than neutral mass. If you don't do this, you will not be able to do the visualization in CLIPS MS. Um, next up, we do care about charges all the way down to plus one. So I'm going to change the charge range to be from one to 50. And I also want to change the minimum number of detected charges down to one. I do not need to see every fragment in at least three charge states to, to believe it's there. Even if I have only a single charge state for a fragment ion, I want it to be represented. Now, I note that this is changed back to extract all because I hid the chromatogram. I click on the spectrum again. We see that we still have our settings to MH plus, charge range starting at one and minimum number of detected charges. But now we're back on the apply button and we can deconvolve just this single spectrum. So let's hit that button. It's going to take a moment, but starting from the tandem mass spectrum above, as observed, this tandem mass spectrum has now been deconvolved to masses. Uh, and we also have the extract results down below. The, here we have our mass and intensity. So we've changed away from an M over Z axis to a mass axis instead. And we note that a large number of the fragments that have been deconvolved here have just one charge state. You have to go down a while before you hit, uh, there was one just in that last screen. Here we have an example of a particular mass that is found at different charge states, I think plus one and plus two. But most of these are observed at only one mass. So you can see that turning this feature to a minimum number of detected charges of one gives us a much more informative tandem mass spectrum than having it set to three. Uh, before we move too much further, I want to highlight one other feature about this deconvolved spectrum. You see that we have this really large mass up here of 16797, uh, or, or about uh, eight, uh, sorry, 17 ki uh, kilodaltons. Um, this is important because in this case, we're looking at an ETD spectrum. You can see that it specifies that in the file name. Um, we have some amount of decharged um, precursor ion in, in cases where the precursor has probably accepted electrons in the ETD process, but it has not dissociated. So as, as uh, my, my friend Julia uh, Shamoruk says, it's ET without the D. Uh, we have an electron transfer, but we didn't get dissociation. So there's some amount of unfragmented precursor here, and that is of extraordinary benefit to us. Because remember, when we do our visualization of the, of the um, proteoform spectrum match, we, we will want to know what was the intact mass we observed for this precursor. Okay, so uh, we can do simple, uh, something relatively straightforward here by opening our calculator, and we can ask, is this in fact a, a, a complete precursor? So, 16797.6891. And uh, if you recall, we had a precursor mass to charge specified uh, right here, so I don't have to look at it from the original spectrum, 801.4. So I'm going to divide by uh, 801.4193. What I see is that I have a number really close to an integer, 21 in this case. There's a strong hint here that the precursor ion is a 21 plus charge, regardless of what appeared in the uh, MS, uh, in the original M over Z spectrum. Um, so we can, we can uh, hope at least that this is an intact precursor measurement that we can use for visualization. Okay, now we return to our instructions. We remind ourselves what we're supposed to be doing. Ah, we're supposed to export this tandem mass spectrum uh, in deconvolved form to CSV format, and I've written XLS. So let me explain what that looks like. I have this table down here, and I might think I could just do a con control A to select all, copy it all to the clipboard, and then paste it into Excel. But things are, in fact, a little messier than that. So instead, I'm going to need to click on some row of the extract results table. You can see that it's trying to keep track of which ions in the original MSMS and in the deconvolved mass spectrum uh, relate to that particular peak. Now I want to go to Workspace Options, 
and exports. The exports option allows us to export the selection as. So that's what we want to use. And in this case, by clicking on a row of the extract results table, we selected that table. So now we export selection as, and it can allow us to nominally export a CSV file, um, a comma separated values text file uh, representing those results. And we simply say, okay, not a problem. Now it asks us where to throw that and unhelpfully, it wants to throw it in the template directory of freestyle. That's not reasonable. Uh, instead, I'm going to throw it in the directory where I'm storing all my tutorial files, which is down here. I copy that to the clipboard, come to the address pane up here, tell it I want to put the file there. And this name, it's got to go. It's way too long. Instead, I want to create a file called 794 because this is scan 794 from this file. But I note that it's saving it as an XLS file, not a CSV file. So this is a little confusing. We just clicked a, a, a button that said export a CSV and it's giving us an Excel file instead. So already we're off to kind of a weird start. Here we see that X, uh, the 794 file opens automatically and we see that there's a really big loss by exporting these data to Excel instead of a CSV file, which is what we've requested. Instead, we see that what we have is a dynamic content Excel document. You can see that we jump directly from row two to row six. That means rows three through five are hidden and they only appear if you click this plus. So the actual data of this table is actually much, much more than we wanted. We didn't, we, what we wanted was just masses and intensities. Instead, we have all of this extra stuff showing up that we did not ask for. All right, so that's not ideal. We need to get this into a, a format that is actually useful for our visualizers downstream. And for this, I'm gonna want just column B and column C, the mass and the intensity. All this other stuff, I want to go away. So let's go ahead and click columns B and C. I've highlighted the both of those. I'm copying that to the clipboard. And now I'm going to create a new file in our, pro in our tutorial directory called 794.txt. So I go to new, specify I want a text document, and 794.txt. If your screen looks very slightly differently, uh, this is probably just changing because I'm using Windows 11 and your machine might still be using Windows 10. Frankly, there are a lot of things about Windows 11 that cause me problems, so I, I kind of envy you on that score, but that's okay. Uh, let us now uh, open our 794 text file over in our text editor, Notepad++. So I've opened 794.txt, uh, it's empty at the moment, I'm now just going to paste those columns that we had in the uh, spreadsheet into our text file here. Now that's still not quite right, is it? We, we have this empty column, uh, empty row three, empty row five, empty row seven, and we also have a header row. The header row is not something that we need. We can go ahead and just delete that. And now we have just M over, uh, just masses and intensities and a bunch of blank lines. That Those bunch of blank lines though, are where our special feature within Notepad++ is going to come in handy. I'm going to select all, go to the edit menu, drop down to line operations, and this is the feature that you will not typically find on a text editor. And now I'm going to go to remove empty lines containing blank characters. So you can do this in some programmable text editors like Emacs and stuff like this. Um, but if you're just using Notepad, you will not have this, this option. Notepad++ does. So remove empty lines containing blank characters. And Bob's your uncle. You're great. Now you have masses and intensities, and they're separated by tabs. Now, I, you, you'll note that the disk icon here is still red. That's to tell us that we haven't actually saved this to the hard drive yet. So let's go ahead and click the Save button to, to do that. Now, we should be able to open this text file in Excel. Let's pop over to Excel. It still has this really crazy format uh, Excel document in it. Let's just close that. We don't need to save changes to it. Oh, we're so sorry about your poor clipboard. Okay, so now we have Excel here. We can now simply drag 794 text over to it. And we see that we have mass values and, and, and intensity values with none of that uh, expanded text uh, uh, option stuff in there. That's great. 
So let us now proceed on to our next stage where we can use ProSite itself. Do I have anything left in my directions for what I was supposed to do? All right, options, open in Excel, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now we need to start ProSite Lite. ProSite Lite is, um, installs just like pretty much any other software on your, on your computer. Here's ProSite Lite's, oops, main user interface. Um, because I'm, I've got my screen set kind of small for recording, uh, I'm going to just open this up to, to maximize it. We have two steps that we need to undertake before ProSight is going to visualize it for us. We first need to add the experimental data. You can see it's got that little warning, no experimental data in. And then we need to add the sequence that we want to, uh, to align against the spectrum. So let's add our experimental data first. We see that we need to provide precursor information and we need to provide fragment information. And we need to specify a few things. Is it monoisotopic mass? Yes, we have good enough resolution to know the monoisotope of our precursor. We uh, did our deconvolution in MH plus mode, so definitely click the MH plus option here. The fallback is not identifying anything, so definitely click the MH plus button. We need to tell it what type of fragmentation mode was used, ETD, and our fragmentation tolerance. 10 ppm should be just fine. Okay, so let's uh, grab our fragment ion list out. So let us grab the mass and the intensities from here. I'm going to just grab, uh, oop, I'm going to just pull down to the bottom of the list. We have a fair number of peaks here, and it's worth kind of knowing that. Is 253 peaks a reasonable number uh, for a tandem mass spectrum after deconvolution? And I would say that, yeah, for a, a protein that's, say, 150 amino acids long, as we have in this case, um, having 253 fragments observed is, is not really extraordinary. If this number were more than 1,000, I would worry that the deconvolution had uh, not been performed correctly and wasn't even centroided, for example. But uh, let, let's now copy this to the fragments list. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I am making an error. We're going to come back to this later. It doesn't look like I've made an error. The software says, ah, there are 254 lines here. That's all great. I have my masses and I have my intensities. Um, but we're going to come back to that later and see something really odd that was hiding in this screen. Okay, let us return to our precursor mass, though. We still need to get that. You see that our mass is 16797. We're going to use this number as our precursor mass, measured in the tandem mass spectrum, not in the mass spectrum. It's kind of an odd choice, but in, in the ETD spectrum we have here, some amount of unfragmented precursor is available to us, so we're going to use it. 16797. 16797. I have a very small memory, so I'm going to come back here and get the decimal part. 6891. 6891. Okay, how are we doing? We have a precursor known monoisotopically. We have masses given in charged mode. We have our masses, we have our intensities, we have our ETD, we have our fragmentation tolerance set at 10 ppm, and save. And we are rewarded by ProSight Lite with a green check mark. Experimental data is now in place. Let us now add a candidate sequence. Now, I might be able to tell you that I can simply enter the accession of the Uniprot entry corresponding to the sequence, click search, and it'll just populate everything for me. The reality is I have not been able to get this feature to work yet. And that might be a Windows 11 thing, or it might be a David Tab thing. I'm not sure. But I'm going to ignore the Uniprot accession field because it doesn't work in my case. Now, uh, let us write down the sequence. Here I have the sequence in the, uh, that I got from running Topic on these data. Uh, I didn't get this from ProSite. I got it from Topic. Um, and you'll note that Topic uh, has this, uh, this nice thing of including uh, what is found on either side of the last breakpoint. I'm just grabbing the whole thing at the moment. I'm going to paste that sequence in here. And this is an easy example because I've got no disulfide bridges to worry about and no oxidations of methionine. I just have the sequence. But wait, something's going on. You'll see that this box has, is remaining red and the save button is grayed out. I can't do it. That's because ProSite Lite has spotted the fact that I have some non-sequence letters in my sequence. I've got that period at the end. I need to delete that away. And I have a period at the beginning. I need to delete that away. Now, saving is an option. So I go ahead and click Save, and suddenly we're off to the races. Just like that, the software has visualized a, a fragment map for this particular proteoform spectrum match. 
the information that we provided about the observed mass, 16796, matches very well with a calculated theoretical mass. So ProSite has accepted the sequence and no PTMs that I provided, added them up to find that theoretically the mass of the sequence should be 16796.63. To be only 0 0.05 mass units away is pretty great. Uh, we see that the PPM error corresponding to that is 3.3. So we feel very, very good about the mass match of the intact precursor. We also get some scoring information out. Um, so uh, remember, ProSite Lite did not search the, a database for this sequence. It is a particular sequence we provided for this particular spectrum. But it does go ahead to provide some scoring information about what kind of, um, what kind of uh, P score should have resulted if this had been a sequence drawn from search. What, what percentage of all fragments that might have been seen were observed? 17%. What fraction of the, uh, of the uh, peptide bonds have some sort of evidence here? 56%. That's all rather nice. Um, now, I would note that we do have the ability to add some modifications after the fact. If, for example, we had noticed that the observed mass was 16 mass units higher than the theoretical mass, we might have come in here to click on a methionine, oxidize it, and then we would see that our, our uh, theoretical mass jumps. But in this case, we don't actually need to do anything like that. This methionine is not modified. We get a better mass match when no PTMs are in play. Um, so a lot of people would think of this fragment map as the, as the main documentation of a proteiform spectrum match. What I would note, however, is that this does not give us a visualization of how, met, how much of the intensity observed in the deconvolved mass spectrum, uh, deconvolved tandem mass spectrum is accounted for by the sequence. That visualization is not provided here. But we can do exports of these, uh, of these uh, forms to a couple different formats, portable network graphics and scalable vector graphics. Um, one of the things I want to do before we go any further, though, is to remember to save this, uh, this document. I get really tired of having to re-enter the mass lists and re-enter the, uh, the sequences. We don't have to do that, though, because if I just click Save, I'm able to write this 794 spectrum as its own file. And then in the future, I can simply double click on that file and get it back out. I keep trying to click this button. There we go. Uh, so what we see is that we have 794.pcml created in this directory. And this PCML represents all of that work together. It represents the deconvolved mass spectrum, and it represents the sequence that has been aligned to it in this case. Now, I want to show you something before we go any further that I find really bothersome. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a, a hidden uh, bug of sorts in the software. So um, let's now open 794.pcml in a text editor. So I know I can do this because this is markup language, and markup languages are almost always something you can open in a text editor. Now, you may look at this and say, that is a bunch of gobbledygook, but I, I want to promise you that this is actually pretty easily read XML. It's an XML re representing this proteoform spectrum match. We, can, we have our precursor mass. Its type is set to monoisotopic. We use DTD, it, um, also using monoisotopic masses for fragments. Uh, and the intensity scales on the absolute blah, blah, blah. All fine. But what I want to do is walk through the fragments that we have observed. We have 378, 3274, 395, 261. These are clearly not in order now. Has the software changed the ordering of our fragments? So let us look at this very first um, uh, line of spectrum from the monoisotopic mass list. Remember that we saved it to the 794 text file. We see that the first mass should be 378.2, then 395.2, then 481.2. 378, 395, 481. 378 is here, 395 is here, 481 is here. And these three are all listed as having an intensity of one. Ah, something awful has happened behind the scenes and if we didn't look at this, we might not understand it. But here we see that we had two values on each of these lines, this being the mass 
this being the intensity. But 3274 is not being read by the software as an intensity. 3274 is being recorded as another mess. Oh, well, that's obviously not going to fly. So let us fix this right away. We would have liked that the software told us that our experimental data was entered in a flawed way, but it did not. Fragments one per line. Instead, it has read this uh, each line of this as two fragment masses, not a fragment and an intensity. The software does not seem to have any way at present for taking an intensity from this into the PCML output. That is a, a, a surprising error. So let us now get rid of all of those fragments. We're going to return to Excel where we had a copy of this text file open. This time we will grab only the, uh, only the masses, not the intensities. Just leave those out altogether. I don't even want to give it any blank spaces. I want to get just the masses. Now I will paste those into the mass list and click save. Right now we have 85 peaks matched. Still, we have 85 peaks matched. That's good. Let's save this document. And now let's see if the PCML file changed. I have it saved right here. And I'm going to just drag this over there. Once again, we see that we have our fragment ions listed in sort of ordinary form, but now all the intensities are listed as one because we didn't provide any intensity information because it wasn't being used. And now we have our masses in the correct order. So unless you want the software to perhaps perform some false matching, it's really important that you give it only a mass list until that, uh, until that error is addressed. Okay, so the PCML file is wonderful because now in the future, I can come back to open this and see exactly which data corresponded to this particular visualization of a proteiform spectrum match. Okay, now we can do some exports. So let's dump out a portable network graphic. If you're accustomed to something like a, a GIF or a JPEG, this is a, a kind of a, a, a bitmap like that. So we're gonna call, call this one 794 ping and we're going to call the SVG 794.svg. OK, so we see that we have these two files created. Are they similar in size? Are they completely redundant for each other? Well, what we see is that they're actually very different sizes. The, the vector graphic, the, the scalable vector graphic, is 25k. And the ping, the, the, the bitmap, is about 10 times the size. Now, if I open this, in just uh, my default system viewer, I see something that looks kind of weird, and I might worry that I didn't export this correctly. What we're seeing, however, is actually transparency. This figure has a whole bunch of its uh, its positions called tr uh, labeled transparent, which means that whatever is behind it is what is shown there. So I'm going to uh, view this instead of doing it in the system viewer in uh, a bitmap editor that I use all the time called paint.net. Um, it's just a, a happy little program that I've used for probably a decade at this point. Um, so I'm going to just drag the PNG into that. Now we see that we have this weird checkbox, um, uh, checkered background. In, in paint.net, that background of, of white and gray spaces is, is checkered to let you know this is an area of transparency. So if I were to paste this on top of a blue background, all of that would be blue. If I paste it on a white background, all of that will be white. If I paste it on a speech bubble in a meme graphic, it would uh, that would be that would work just fine. We also note that the resolution that it exports these um, fragment maps to is very large. Four thousand dots across is actually publication quality. Um, I don't know what DPI that's intended to be, but it is it's high. So you can use these pretty successfully without worrying about pixelation, even if you were to put it on a poster um, printed a foot wide. But I would note that there are still some reasons that you should think about using the scalable vector graphic format. I use a tool called Inkscape for working with these images. Um, and it, it's kind of a slow loader, so uh, we'll, we'll take a moment to get that open. But there's a lot you can do with a scalable vector graphic a lot more simply than you can with a portable network graphic. One is the bitmap, as I said, and this is a vector graphic. Well, we, we note that there's already some weird stuff because the page size um, that this image is drawn against is not, com not commensurate with its actual size. 
we'd want the page size to grow up a little bit. But one of the things that I might note is that I'm concerned people looking at my poster might think that the sequence starts with an asparagine rather than a methionine. So let's say I want to get rid of that N. Here I can click on that N as a letter and simply click delete. That's a whole lot easier than painting it out with a paintbrush in paint.net. Maybe I want to get rid of these numbers. I can simply click them and delete them. Um, I can also do things like uh, draw a big arrow pointing to this letter E, for example. All of that's feasible um, and very scalably by using Inkscape. So very nice software for dealing with that. But if you're going to deal with it as a bitmap, you're going to care about the ping. If you're going to deal with it as a vector graphic, you're going to deal with it um, as, a spectra, uh, as a scalable vector graphic. Okay, so we're doing very well, but there's one more thing I would really like to do, and that's to get a list of which ions ProSite Light was able to attribute to a mass in the mass list I provided. So you see that there's this tiny little button over here. You might think that it was hidden under export up here, but it is not. It is down here in this tiny little Excel icon. If you click on this, you will see that it's going to create yet another uh, spreadsheet from this, uh, from this data set. We're calling this 794, but I'm going to call this 794 ProSite Lite. Oop, L-I-T-E. There we go. So what was output to this file? We can come over to our tutorial directory and open 794 ProSite Lite. In just a moment, we see that each of the ions that was matched, its ion type and ion number, theoretical mass, observed mass, and mass difference in absolute and PPM scales is provided right here. And I see that I have 86 rows in this table. Um, subtract the, the header row and you have 85 matches. That's the same as what we saw in our ProSite light screen. So 85 matches is what was observed. Okay, so with all that finished, um, we feel pretty happy about being able to do our visualization in ProSite Lite. Let us now try this in a different toolkit, one called Clips MS. Now, Clips MS was published in only 2020, so it's a very recent tool. Um, and I'm going to put, try to close some of these bonus windows that we've got uh, created along the way. Uh, all right, I'm going to go ahead and cl close out. Well, I'll at least just minimize this for now. Um, I, need, I need to start the Clips MS software. Now, I have already expanded out Clips MS on my hard drive, and I moved it to Program Files, and it has the Clips MS executable here. I'm going to go ahead and tell the software to start. Now, while it's starting, this, this is not a fast process. This is not what Clips MS looks like. This is just its console window opening behind the scenes, but it, it often takes a lot of time for Python tools that have been bundled up into an EXE to open. Um, and we're just going to have to have to wait a little bit for that. It's not a particular feature of Clips MS. It's a feature of the way that this uh, executable, executable got bundled together. You might think, oh, I have Python installed on my computer. I think I'll run it from the command line. And that might seem to work, but I've actually noticed quite a few problems that crop up when you attempt to run uh, Clips MS from the Python command line rather than running it as an executable. Some of the features like popping up an error dialog box um, don't seem to work properly on the command line. So instead, uh, I would suggest you just click on the executable like this. Okay, so here we have the CLIPS interface, the comprehensive localization of internal protein sequences. Uh, Carter Lance at, uh, in, in Joe Lou's group uh, published this software, as I said, a couple years ago. It has some features to it that make it um, very valuable if you're trying to understand your spectra at a very deep level. And I would really like more people to know about it. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give an introduction of it here. We still have to supply our PPM errors. Um, I'm going to use 10 because I have no reason not to use 10. It's what we used in ProSite Lite just a moment ago. So that should be the same. It wants to have the sequence. Again, I need to provide just the sequence and not uh, stuff like those flanking periods uh, that my software, uh, that uh, topic, sorry, uh, had produced. I'm going to copy just the sequence and paste that in. Now we get to the thing that makes CLIPS particularly special, and that is internal protein sequences. It is not the case when we break a proteoform that we see just terminal ions, which is to say ions that contain the N-terminus or ions that contain the C-terminus. You might have generated a large uh, terminal ion 
that fragments again. For example, if you create a, a Z ion, a Z ion that contains the C terminus in ETD, you might break it again to create an ion that is neither a C nor a Z, but has the ends of both of them. Now, I tend to think that you want an ion of some size before it's going to give you much information about internal sequence. I don't, I don't, for example, want to see an internal ion that's just a single amino acid. That would be very uninformative. So in this case, I'm simply going to enter 10 as the fragment size that I want to work with. Now we get to something that I find uh, very bedeviling, probably because I'm using Windows 11, but I'm not actually sure. And that is when we enter the observed fragments. The observed fragments need to be provided in CSV format. Before you panic, that's just a comma separated values text file. That's not a problem. We can generate that no sweat. Remember that we had these data in Excel saved in text format. We're now going to save this in CSV format. So uh, I'm going to click Save As. And now I pull down to CSV UTF-8 comma delimited star.csv file. Easy. I click Save and I should be done. This should be very straightforward. So let us uh, let us look at the file that resulted. Well, I'm, I'm going to just click 794 CSV for now. We'll come back to this in just a moment. OK, so I click Open. It uh, recognizes that file and says, this is the one that's great. I have no N-terminal modifications, no C-terminal modifications, no localized modifications, and no unlocalized modifications. It is possible, however, to define sets of modifications in CSV format for the software to read. Now, don't be tempted into clicking Run Program yet, because we haven't told it what kind of fragmentation we've got. This is an ECD or ETD spectrum. C and Z ions are included, and CZ fragments are included, which is to say ions that have been truncated, uh, where, where both termini have been truncated from the ion. OK, now I can click Run Program, and everything should be great. It says, do I want to assign terminal fragments first? This is actually a really important question, and I, I hope to explain it just a little bit here. If you have a mass that could be explained as a C ion or a Z ion, rather than as a CZ ion, which is to say one that's a double fragment, would you prefer that it be called a C or Z ion rather than a CZ ion? And I think that we would. It's more parsimonious to claim that just one breakage occurred to create this mass than to claim that two breaks occurred. So I would say, yes, if you can assign a mass to a terminal fragment first, that's better. So I'm going to click yes, and we should be off to the races. And I might sit here and wait quite a while and not understand why I have no output. But remember that when this software launched, it also created a console window in the back. So I'm going to just flip over to that. We see that we told it to run the biased version, which meant that we wanted it to assign terminal fragments first. It collected, uh, calculated the molecular weight. That was all fine. Generated terminal fragments with some misspellings. We're not going to judge them. Um, but look at this. We have an exception. Now, an exception is an error created by the software. And we see that it's given us, a, a, as usual, a rather wordy, um, a, a very wordy explanation for how that occurred. That's frustrating, um, but that's just one of those things Python does. And remember, the graphical user interface gave us no indication that there was a problem. We had to look back here at the console to find it. What we have is a value error. It could not convert a string to float. In this case, the software is trying to read that CSV file that we provided, and it's running into a problem. So let's look at the CSV file that we produced. Uh, all right, I am, there we are. So 794.csv was our, our CSV for the spectrum. Do you remember the number 378.2166766? We look over here, here it is. Cannot convert string to float. Three weird characters, 378.2166766. It's this very first value. The very first mass value is already causing a problem for the parser, the thing that reads this text into memory as a bunch of numbers. So this is a big problem for us. Um, let's look at the CSV file, not in Excel, but rather in the text editor. All right, so we, we have our 794 file. We want our text editor open. Now I'm going to drag the CSV file over there. When we look at the CSV file, 
we also do not see uh, the, the first characters. We do, however, see that there's a comma separating the mass from the intensity. That's all great. So I'm going to do something that may seem kind of strange. And if you did not see this error, I'm very grateful for you because it means the software is working as it should. Again, I, this is a problem that only cropped up on my computer. So I'm going to show you how to solve it, and it's going to seem far dumber than it should. Uh, so we have a 794 CSV file. We're going to create another file. This one will be called um, irritated, because I hate bugs. Uh, irritated.csv, just like that. Oh, don't complain at me. Just do it. All right, so here's irritated CSV. We're going to open that in our text editor. So we have 794. I'm going to do a select all, a copy, come to irritated CSV, and then paste it. Now I'm simply going to save irritated CSV. Let us now return to Clips MS. I'm going to tell it not to get its observed fragments from 794, but from irritated, which I remind you, I copied every every character of 794 to irritated. I click open. It says, okay, I'm going to take my fragments from irritated instead. And now I'm going to click run program. Yes, I want to assign terminal fragments first. Now let's click over to what's going on behind the scenes. This time it was able to read my fragments perfectly. So what is it about Excel that it is creating three weird bytes, unprintable characters at the start of its CSV output? I have no idea, it has no business doing that, but it caused me a problem that I had to chase down for about an hour the other day. Okay, so because Dave is slow, we'll just uh, jump through this relatively quickly. We have quite a lot of output being generated by Clips MS. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why I think it's important to look at tools that are not necessarily mainstream because there's a lot of innovation that's happening there. This tool is, is giving us three different kinds of visualizations for this proteoform spectrum match. It still has a fragment map, but you'll see that it's separated into two different parts. We have the terminal fragments where a C or Z ion was observed, and we also have internal fragments, which is to say we have some fragment that spans an internal region. I think this might be best visualized by the fragment location plot. Remember that C, uh, sorry, that C ions are N terminal and Z ions are C terminal. So we can see that these ions all have a, a shared endpoint, the C terminus, and these ions are all uh, sharing an N terminus. So that's all very good. Um, and that we have a, a, a line that extends into the proteoform to tell us how far into the proteoform that particular fragment ion extends. That is already a really, really important visualization to tell us about uh, how these sequences align against this, the, the spectrum. Um, we also, however, have this set of internal fragments. Now, if you have a, one of these diagrams where the internal fragments are far more common than the terminal fragments, I'm going to suggest that you've got a lot of random matches occurring. But I don't think that that's likely the case here because we have a relatively small number of these matches. So how do the internal fragments compare to the terminal fragments in their, in their explaining the sequence? In this case, we see that we have a T and F breakpoint observed in an internal fragment, and it is also observed in the terminal fragments. We have a VK internal fragment break that corresponds to a breakpoint seen in a terminal fragment. We have FF, yep, FN, yep, but look down here at something like AE. We do not have evidence from the C or Z ions for this AE breakpoint, but we do from an internal fragment. If we limited ourselves to just C and Z ions, we would not have evidence for this particular breakpoint. So if you're trying to do something like localize a modification, these internal ions may provide some information above and beyond what you can get from C and Z ions. We also have a heat map. Now, I'm admittedly a little less in love with the heat maps, and I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit of why, but they, they are a useful visualization. I just think that they, they can be overinterpreted. Let's start with the fact that both of these go to a maximum darkness scale. We've got the maximum darkness on terminal fragments, which we see on the letter M, where the initial methionine is found in more C ions, uh, C ions than any other, uh, sorry, 
th this is essentially counting how many times was this amino acid observed in the terminal ion, whether it was a C or a Z. And what we had from our fragment location graph is a report that we had lots of C ions and maybe half as many Z ions. So what we're seeing is this reflected by the fact that methion the initial methionine is in every C ion because that is the N terminus. Necessarily, the methionine will be included in it. So we see that the heaviest weight falls on this initial methionine, and about half as much weight falls on the terminal alanine. Be even though the terminal alanine is in every Z ion, um, there are fewer Z ions than there are C ions. That's how we can interpret this. Now we note that we go to just as dark a level in the internal fragments, but we don't see the same favoritism for the, the termini. Instead, these are colored very, very lightly because no internal fragment can contain the M at the N terminus or the A at the C terminus. Instead, what we're seeing are letters within the sequence that are uh, featured in these internal fragments. But I want to note that there's something sort of deceptive about these scales. Both of them go to the same level of darkness, but the highest level of darkness here is around 50, and the, the, the deepest, darkest blue here corresponds to only six internal fragments. We also have the ability to write these uh, fragment reports out using the save option. Uh, what you see is that we have the option of writing them to PostScript if you're creating a LaTeX document, uh, to JPEGs, to PGFs, to PDFs, to PNGs, to PostScripts, and so on, even SVGs. So we actually have a, a much larger set of options for us to save this off to uh, than we do even in ProSite Lite, which does a really nice job, I think. Okay. So let us close these. There's one other thing I would like to show you about the output from this, and that is an output file. Now, I may have told it that I wanted to open a, uh, a, a fragment list here, but uh, in this case, Clips MS does not write its, its output tables to this location. Instead, uh, Clips MS um, writes its outputs to its own program directory file, uh, it, its own directory. So if I sort this on date modified, I will see things like statistics, which gives me a count of how many ions were observed. I can only open that after I close the program though. And matched fragments final. So if I open this, uh, open this table, I get the same kind of tabular format that I did from, um, from ProSite, although formatted slightly differently. Uh, and it includes nice things like the elemental composition of these fragments, um, as well as the sequence of individual fragments. So I think that's rather nice. So you might think that these tools are only giving you graphical appraisals of what the, uh, what the proteoform spectrum match looks like, but in fact, we have quite a lot of information that we can use in tabular form uh, for informing us further about the matches. So with that, you've seen Clips MS and you've seen ProSite Lite, and uh, how, to, how to use them to visualize the very same spectrum. So I really appreciate that you took the time to, uh, to watch today's video. And if you, uh, if you find that you need uh, some clarification, try to leave a comment on YouTube and I will try to get back to it. I tell you, I, it's, it's probably far better to simply email me if you have my email address. Uh, and I will, uh, I will try to, to get back to you uh, expeditiously. But um, with that said, uh, please keep, keep your eye on this YouTube channel because we hope in the future to be giving you information on how to uh, pass uh, inclusion list tandem mass spectra to software like Topic. I'm looking forward to seeing just how well we can make that work, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks very much.